Tonight, growing concern about measles as cases climb in Quebec. It really is just the tip of the iceberg because where did they get it? New infections with no clear origin. The scramble to contain a highly contagious virus. A pro-Palestinian protest leads the Prime Minister's office to cancel a reception during a state visit. Canada's Joshua Liendo is ready to make waves in Paris. At the Olympics, anything can happen. His success in the pool, breaking ground for black swimmers. Me actually being a, a role model myself, it feels kind of surreal. Our conversation in the breakdown. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansi. There are signs tonight measles might be spreading in communities in at least two provinces. It's one of the world's most contagious viruses transmitting through the air, and it can have dangerous consequences. A CBC News count now has at least 13 infections in Canada, but it's three cases that are most concerning, two in Quebec and one in Ontario, that are seemingly not connected to travel or other known cases in Canada. Doctors say it's unlikely this country is headed for a massive outbreak, but as Katie Nicholson shows us, there is concern for children and people who haven't been vaccinated. Benjamin Dermer's daughter is fully vaccinated, but his family's planning on heading to Quebec for March break, where seven cases of measles have been confirmed. My questions would be, is, is this alarming? I know there are potential serious outcomes, but I have no sense of whether or not the, these outbreaks are really significant in my life. Quebec is promising an update on Monday. What's worrying doctors there most is community spread, unrelated cases with unknown origins in the Montreal area. It really is just the tip of the iceberg because where did they get it? Uh, from whom and who are the, that person that they got it from? To who else are they spreading it? Public health is tracking down who might have been exposed, but doctors say measles is so contagious, it's a tough job. It can stay in the air if someone's in a hospital room or in a waiting room. It can linger in the air for a while, so that patient may be gone, but someone else comes in and they may be exposed. Canada eliminated measles back in 1998, but vaccination rates have been backsliding. In 2021, just 79% of seven-year-olds had two doses of the vaccine. The World Health Organization says 95% of the population needs to be vaccinated to maintain measles herd immunity. If we start to see community spread of measles, we're going to start to see more cases. And unfortunately, the consequence of that, more severe cases and, you know, potentially very young people um, ending up in hospital. Children under one, people who aren't immunized or who are immunocompromised are most at risk. In the U.S., the Centers for Disease Control confirmed 41 cases in 16 states, 10 in Florida, most at an elementary school near popular spring break destination, Fort Lauderdale. It makes me a little concerned. So my daughter's fully vaccinated, but my son can't get his second one until he is four. And he's high risk for a lot of other issues. Worries that may soon spill over to parents on this side of the border. Katie, let's get back to the question the father asked at the beginning of your story. What's the risk? Well, the number of shots has changed over the years. So depending on when you were born, uh, you might want to check with your doctor whether you're fully immunized. Adults who've undergone chemo or who have other underlying health issues might want to consult their doctors about getting boosters. Now, Dr. Banerjee says very young infants get some antibodies from their mothers and from breast milk that lasts up to about six months. And she says you can give a child mes a measles shot as early as nine months. And you can also bump up your child's vaccination schedule to get a second shot earlier if there is an increased risk. But she says if you're really worried about catching measles on spring break, maybe don't go to a place where there is a known outbreak. Katie Nicholson reporting from Toronto. The Quebec coroner's office has opened an investigation into the death of a patient in a Montreal area hospital who reported chest pains and then waited 45 minutes for an ambulance. He later died in the hospital's waiting room. There were simply not enough ambulances on the road, according to the head of the local paramedics union. On, on, on priorise pas le transport des patients en ajoutant des véhicules. C'est sûr que ça va arriver encore une fois, encore probablement dans le futur. The patient is the third to die in that same hospital's emerge since November while waiting for care. The U.S. Vice President is calling for Israel and Hamas to accept a ceasefire deal with her strongest comments to date. Given 
the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Kamala Harris says a six-week ceasefire is on the table and that Hamas needs to agree to it. As for Israel, Harris says it needs to do more to increase aid to Gaza, calling what's happening there a humanitarian catastrophe. The U.S. began airdropping food along Gaza's coastline yesterday. Tensions over the war boiled over outside an event in Toronto last night. The Prime Minister was supposed to host a reception for Italy's leader, but cancelled at the last minute after pro-Palestinian protesters blocked the entrance. J.P. Tasker now with their reaction. Outside the Art Gallery of Ontario, about 400 pro-Palestinian protesters blocking the entrance. The demonstration forcing the cancellation of a planned reception for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Italian counterpart, Georgia Maloney. You are complicit in the genocide. Your hands are red. One demonstrator directing his anger at International Development Minister Ahmed Hussein. You are complicit in the murder of my family members and my friends. Shame on you. Police moved to control the crowd. Stay back! Stay back! Liberal MP Marco Mendicino was there, saying on social media, these thugs think they scored a win last night, but all they did was lose public support and embarrass themselves. Toronto police say no one was injured or arrested, but they are investigating. One protester spoke to CBC News. He would only give his first name, Kazan. People want to show, to show the Canadian government that it needs to end its complicity in this genocide. And yeah, cancelling the event, I think, is a success. For today. This former top Mountie says this protest could have spiraled out of control. Agencies needed to call off the event to protect everyone and avoid um, some type of incident that could have diplomatic consequences. This pro-Palestinian activist says anger with Ottawa has boiled over. I think that it's coming off the backs of fe people feeling really helpless. Um, you know, what else can they do other than show their displeasure? Well, I think it's, it's, it's genuinely more dangerous. But this former top civil servant says increasingly angry protests targeting politicians are having an effect. I know uh, people that decided not to run again in 2021 or won't run again next year because of this work environment, uh, largely because uh, they don't want to put their families through it. And it's expensive. The cost to protect the Prime Minister has surged. The latest figure suggests it's nearly $3 million a month. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Donald Trump could be in for a very good week. He's poised to win all 15 states holding primary votes this Super Tuesday. As Katie Simpson explains, this would move Trump very close to the Republican nomination. Wherever Donald Trump goes, huge crowds follow. On the final weekend of campaigning before Super Tuesday, his rallies drew thousands of enthusiastic supporters. I love him. I don't care what anybody says about him. I freaking love him. Trump has already won every single Republican primary and caucus, with the exception of Washington, D.C. And he's expected to dominate Super Tuesday when 15 states and one territory hold their contests. Over the past week, it's been sort of in a rocket. We've been uh, launching like a rocket. Oh, it's great to see all of you. Thank you. Nikki so Haley, Trump's last remaining challenger, will find it hard to continue on with her campaign if the votes go as expected, especially in light of new polls showing Trump gaining momentum on President Joe Biden. A CBS News poll puts Trump at 52 percent support, while Biden sits at 48 percent. The four-point lead is Trump's largest of any national survey yet, though it's still close to the poll's 3.5 percent margin of error. Another poll from The New York Times says 73 percent of respondents either strongly or somewhat agree that Biden is too old to be an effective president, compared to 42 percent who said the same about Trump. And the United States will do more. High-profile gaffes are hurting Biden's campaign, like on Friday when he repeatedly confused Gaza and Ukraine. Of the additional food and supplies in the Ukraine. But Trump is making these kinds of mix-ups too, repeatedly referring to Barack Obama as the sitting president. And Putin, you know, has so little respect for Obama that he's starting to throw around the nuclear war. You heard that? Nuclear. 
Despite all of this, Haley's campaign has failed to resonate in a meaningful way. And unless she pulls some sort of rabbit out of her hat on Super Tuesday, her time on the campaign trail is likely nearing its end. And Katie, Donald Trump's also preparing for what could be more good news from the U.S. Supreme Court. The court is releasing at least one decision on Monday, and the thinking here in Washington is that it could be the ruling on whether a state can ban Trump from being on election ballots. Three states are trying to disqualify him on the grounds that he participated in an insurrection, but based on the way that the hearing went and the way questions were asked, it appears the court is leaning in Trump's favor. So it is widely expected to not ban Trump from ballots. So again, that could be another shot of momentum for Trump's campaign. Katie Simpson in Washington. Airfares are down in Canada, but some prices are going up. Airlines are hiking fees for everything from checked bags to cancellations. Sophia Harris breaks down what you need to know to avoid blowing your budget. Fernando Chicas wanted to take his family on a long overdue trip to Vancouver. So he booked four non-refundable tickets with discount carrier Flair Airlines but had to cancel when he realized he made a mistake when booking the dates. That's not good. The problem? Some of Flair's change in cancellation fees have more than doubled. So it would cost Chicas more to cancel than he paid for the flight. That means he gets no travel credits for forfeiting a trip his family can't take. I was shocked. Um, I didn't expect things to be or the charges to be that high. I, I am not very happy <laughs> with that. Air Canada and WestJet have also hiked fees for checked bags on economy fares by five bucks. The starting price is now $35. Airlines say they charge for the extras to keep base fares lower for all passengers. Over the past year, airfares in Canada have dropped by 14%. But this expert warns some passengers may still wind up paying more than they bargained for. It can really add up a lot if you're uh, wanting to get meals, you want in certain seats and so on. And it's a way of the uh, airlines making some money, more money from us. Another problem, travelers may find it more difficult to shop around when booking flights. Often those add-on fees are not uh, readily available up front, especially when you're comparing pricing. Um, so it can be very difficult for customers to know what they are comparing across all airlines. In an email, Transport Canada said Canada's air carriers are responsible for making their own business decisions, including how they charge for optional services. So it's up to passengers to navigate the tricky world of added fees. Uh, an upfront cheap cost it, sometimes is not the best option when it comes to spending your money. Chica said he has learned his lesson, but it came at the price yes. of four unused airline tickets. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Vancouver. Officials in Malaysia are pushing for a renewed search for MH370, the plane that mysteriously vanished en route to Beijing nearly 10 years ago. As far as Malaysian is government, government is concerned, we are committed to that search, and the search must go on. The announcement came during the annual gathering of family and friends whose loved ones were among the 239 people on board. Debris has washed up along the coast of Africa and on islands in the Indian Ocean over the years, but underwater searches haven't yet found the plane. A Texas-based company is proposing to perform the search in a new area, saying they won't charge unless they find something. Parts of California are facing a punishing amount of snow and hurricane force winds. The blizzard, especially severe in the Sierra Nevada mountains. But Yvette Bren shows us one way the extreme storm is bringing relief. Plows try to keep up, but the snow just keeps coming. This woman urges other drivers not to risk the highway like they did. No, we're crazy. It was just the whiteout conditions. There were times where my husband couldn't see and we had to stop. I was horrified. I was afraid we would just like drive off the road like we The storm hit hard Friday with winds up to 160 kilometers per hour, shuttering resorts, closing highways and downing power lines. The amount of snow the short period of time, the majority of it fell, and that combined with the high wind speeds um, just led to some impressive results. In some spots, drifts piled up higher than doorways. We've gotten reports of a lot of drifting snow and some snow drifts that are as high as 10 feet. One bright spot in the blizzard, all that snow restores some of the region's dwindling snowpack. 
that's really important because we need that snow for water in the summertime, right? All that snow melts away in rivers and streams and, and lakes and, and reservoirs, and we can kind of, you know, hold that. So that, that I think on that end, it's a pretty big relief uh, for the region. People venture out when the winds relent. I first started just walking and I fell twice, so then I went back and put on the snowshoes, yeah. For those heeding the warnings to stay home and stock up, these Girl Scouts are happy to help with cookies. Oh, yes, please. I would love to take a box. Skiers are thrilled. Wow, this is incredible, first thought. Second is, I hope I make it through this. But it turns this place into a total magical winter wonderland. For them, the magic is just starting, with another meter of powder still set to fall. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. In Texas, fierce winds are feeding wildfires, including one that's already the biggest in that state's history. Crews are rushing to put out spot fires, but the historic Smokehouse Creek fire is just 15% contained. It's already killed two people, scores of livestock, and destroyed more than 500 structures. Some Canadian communities are also bracing for extreme weather in the coming months. After years now of devastating floods, fires, and hasty evacuations, Marina von Stackelberg asks, what's the country doing to prepare? We actually have three locations. Communities in the BC interior are preparing their emergency command centers. For a summer, Ottawa warns could be worse than last year's record-breaking wildfire season. One of the tactics, controlled burns, a method that held off this fire near the town of Kimberley last year. It is proof that uh, the science around how to provide landscape management is there. Um, again, we just need to get the senior levels of government on board. In Yellowknife, after a wildfire last summer led to a three-week mandatory evacuation, the city is now paying to update its communication systems and hire more coordination staff. The biggest thing that's missing is, is dollars to municipalities to actually be prepared. Uh, when it comes to our territorial funding, we receive no funding to be emergency prepared. The provinces and territories have met with Canada's emergency preparedness minister ahead of the upcoming season. So I wouldn't say this is a different strategy. It's about being coordinating uh, to be more responsive. When pressed on what their new strategy was, Harjit Sajjan didn't specify. Instead, he pointed to the need for early wildfire detection and what individuals can do to protect their homes. It was actually moving patio furniture out of the way because most of the patio furniture, when it lights up, it burns longer and it burns brighter. And then the house has a potential to catch on fire. This expert says she doesn't hear a clear plan. We need to hit the ground running now, and not much was said on, okay, what is the implementation going to go forward over the next few weeks? Ottawa has promised to speed up its financial support after disasters hit, but those changes won't happen for over a year. If you're a homeowner, uh, you're, you can't be certain of how much money you're going to get, what it's going to pay for, or even how long it's going to take. Back in Yellowknife, the city is still filling out paperwork to get money from Ottawa for last summer's forest fires, all while trying to prepare for another fast-approaching wildfire season. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. A small town in New Brunswick is reeling after a beloved potato chip factory was destroyed by fire. It's a big part of this community, so a lot of people have lost their jobs. So, heartbreaking. On Friday night, flames ripped through the Covered Bridge Potato Chip Factory, which employs 100 people. No one was injured. The RCMP investigating the cause. A woman who thought she saw her son on his deathbed has suddenly discovered that he's still alive. Sean came to the phone, and we were freaked. The reason for the mix-up and the message for the man's real family. Plus, auditioning for a movie made easy. Where I grew up, I never dreamed that I would ever get to be an actor. Why the use of self-tapes is here to stay. And police in Texas take on a new task. Go, guys, go. Back to where you came from, please. How the unusual chase played out, we're back in two. France is soon expected to become the first country to enshrine the right to an abortion in its constitution. A final vote is scheduled during a rare joint session of Parliament tomorrow. 
The move is in response to the rollback of abortion rights in the United States. An Ontario woman says she's been through a nightmare after watching the man she thought was her son die in hospital, only to find out later her real son is still alive. Dan Takamon now with her emotional journey and the hospital's response. It just looked like Sean. Heather Inslee hadn't seen her son, who struggles with addiction, in years. But when Ottawa's Montfort Hospital called in January to say Sean was there in critical condition, she rushed to his side. He was laying in the bed with the ventilator, all hooked up, all wires, monitors and everything behind him. She watched over him and when he died days later, honoured his wishes to be an organ donor. We cried so much. It was just, it was devastating. Then, on the same day he was cremated, she got a text from him. I phoned my husband and I said, is he dead? Do you think he's really dead? I said, I'm getting this message. After a second text, they called and asked to speak to Sean. Sean came to the phone and we were freaked. In a statement, the hospital acknowledged the misidentification, said the patient's true identity has since been confirmed, his family notified, and that it's reviewing what happened. The hospital didn't respond to questions about how the mistake occurred. The Ontario Hospital Association and other health experts say incidents like this are incredibly rare. Identity is fundamental to safe care, making sure that you're providing the right care to the right person at the right time. In the days that followed, Sean's family managed to find him with the help of Ottawa police. I, I thought, I'm, I'm so happy he's alive, but I, I just went through all that morning. He says he had no idea about all the confusion. It sends chills up my spine. Like, he says it was a big eye-opener and that it offers a second chance. It means getting, making it right with my parents and my, and my family and um, getting back to be part of, part of my family. Inslee says she still doesn't know who she mourned in that hospital bed, but she has a message for his loved ones. We never left his side. We stayed right with him, just as though he was our own son. Inslee says she wants Montfort to come up with a better system for identifying patients to save other families the pain hers has endured. Dan Takama, CBC News, Ottawa. A way to audition for movies popularized during the pandemic is becoming a staple. You're not beholden to, to waiting around for auditions. Why some find self-tape so desirable. Plus... Oh, it is Edward! A Canadian swimmer with Olympic gold ambitions and the talent to back it up. That moment was definitely something that I'll always remember. My interview with rising star Joshua Liendo. And a community's only school lost to fire. It is an emergency and a crisis for our children. Why a permanent solution for students could take years. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Self-tapes have become the new normal for actors trying to book roles in Hollywood. And while they help undiscovered talent break through, they're also costly and time-consuming. Eli Glasner has more on the modern audition process. The night country, it takes us one. After landing a role on the buzzy new season of True Detective, Joel de Montgran is having a great year. Being Indigenous, uh, where I grew up, I never dreamed that I would ever get to be an actor because you had to move to be in place. But his big break started with a self-tape and then a virtual audition with his soon-to-be co-star. She just goes, okay, cut, yep, yeah, that was great, bye. You know, and then I was like, well, I guess I didn't get that. <laughs> the next thing I knew, I was uh, on a plane. <laughs> Gone are the days of in-person auditions. Instead, all you need are lights and a camera or a phone. I used to at least get really nervous in auditions, so self-tapes allow me to take that out of the equation and focus that adrenaline on the work. It's all the parents and grandparents. Veteran casting director Deidre Bowen has embraced the change. I can see a lot more auditions because I don't have to have people lined up out there. So you have a bigger net. I have a much bigger net. And I'll make an adjustment and then do it again. With the bigger net um, come bigger asks. They'll be like, oh, you're coming out of a car and there's a person walking towards you and they're a stranger. Now do it on your couch. 
In an industry where most earn $10,000 per year on average, the head of Canada's Actors Union says performers have become unpaid filmmakers. It was a lot of money out of our pockets that we were never compensated for. Now the unions are pushing back, limiting the number of pages and mandating more preparation time for actors. Still, many actors say self-tapes open doors. Auditions have skyrocketed. You're not beholden to, to waiting around for auditions, being afraid of, of even going back home to the res if you do live in a city. Changing who gets seen and who makes it on our screens. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Now we look deeper into the stories shaping our world. A remote First Nation fights for a new school after a devastating fire. It is an emergency and a crisis for our children. But first, Canada's Joshua Liendo breaking ground for black swimmers. Me actually being a, a role model myself, it feels kind of surreal. He's won gold on the world stage, and now he carries Olympic hopes to Paris. I don't get ahead of myself. I try to stay in the moment. This is The Breakdown. I spoke with Joshua Liendo as he took a break from training at the University of Florida pool, where the expectations of excellence are made very clear. Three, two, one, test complete. Well, Joshua Liendo, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're at the University of Florida pool in Gainesville. As I look over your shoulder there, I feel like you put a lot of hours in that pool. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Definitely more than, than anywhere else on campus. Uh, kind of always always in here, always putting in uh, a lot of yardage, a lot of hours. I want to show our viewers you in a different pool, Commonwealth Games 2022, the 100 meter butterfly final. The crowd going wild over the last, I don't know, 25 meters. I knew I had a chance to win. Um, and I just, you know, just that, that last 25, obviously the, the crowd's going crazy. I just kind of zoned in and tried to put my head down and get my hand on the wall. But uh, being able to get that kind of first milestone for me, um, the, the obviously first uh, gold medal at an international, on the international kind of uh, larger meet uh, stage was, uh, was definitely um, a good, really good experience for me. That moment was definitely something that I'll always remember. Yeah, you seem like a low-key guy, at least talking about it now, but you touch the wall, and then you realize that you've won this breakthrough gold medal. Uh, how, how did that feel at that moment? I mean, it, it, it felt great because the race was really close. Um, I don't know, just like a, a, a mix of emotions. kind of had to remember to calm myself down and uh, go one down and get ready to some another event right after. In 2023, you were named Canada's Male Swimmer of the Year. So it's been a, like a couple of breakout seasons for you. What's, what's powering that? What's behind that? But I feel like definitely the transition of Florida just helped more. Um, I got a different perspective on the sport and obviously an awesome group to train with. Um, you know, Coach Anthony Nesty here, and um, it's just been awesome. I just kept improving, um, which is definitely something that I'm grateful for being here in the group that we have. So your coach is, is an Olympic gold medalist. Over your shoulder, we can see the Olympic rings, and, and underneath those rings are the list of, of uh, University of Florida swimmers who have won gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, does that feel, all of that feel like, like a burden to you or an inspiration? Definitely not a burden. It's for sure an inspiration. It's kind of cool to look up, and, you know, you have the record boards, every, you know, records all around, and kind of seeing the kind of greatness that this program is... Uh, has had is definitely motivation for me. I don't, I don't even say I really feel the pressure. It's just something that I look up at and kind of seeing what people have done in this program. And then it just gives me, gives me more fuel to try and get to the level that they've been at. 23 a new Canadian record for Joshua Liendo. You are going to become known more and more in Canada for what you primarily are, which is an elite athlete. But what's your life like away from the pool? Away from the pool? I don't know, like, like you said, I'm pretty low key, I'm pretty chill, but I mean, I, I enjoy watching sports, you know, playing, playing video games, hanging out with my friends, like just typical, just typical college kid right now. I enjoy music, I, I played music in, uh, in high school a lot, still play a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I just try to, I don't, not always focused in on, on swimming, obviously, obviously when I'm here, I'm, I try to be present, I try to be really focused, but 
obviously when it's time to kind of wind down and time to not think about the sport, I make sure I'm kind of, you know, removing myself, give myself a break. Because it is really intense once I'm in here. You were born in Canada, went to, to Trinidad for a few years till you were nine or ten years old. Um, what impact has Trinidad had on you? I mean, it's it's where I learned to swim. So <laughs> it's it's where I started my swimming journey. It's kind of where I started realizing uh, my potential and my goals. And yeah, it's just a, it's a it's a huge part of um, just me right now in terms of the sport. You know, the, the, the Caribbean nations are known for producing world-class sprinters, Jamaica in particular, but really all, all the various islands, including Trinidad, not so much world-class swimmers, and yet you have these islands surrounded by beautiful ocean. Why do you think we're not yeah. seeing more elite swimmers from the Caribbean? Um, I don't, you're, you're getting more, like, now, more recent, I think, as the, the kind of coaching and the intention to the sport gets a little better. They're kind of seeing, they have... Kids have more role models like, you know, Dylan Carter and you have obviously George uh, Bavel when I was there uh, was a huge role model. But yeah, I, I think it's definitely on an upward trajectory if you look around and see the kind of athletes that are coming from the Caribbean now. I mean, you're a Canadian, you're a Canadian kid, you're a Canadian athlete, but, but uh, do they know about you in Trinidad? Like, have they taken a little bit of ownership of you? Yeah, yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's where I started a lot is where I spent a lot of my childhood, you know, I. I went there like shortly after I was born and I came to Canada when I was in 2012 when I was 10. So, I mean, it's definitely a big part of my life. Uh, you haven't been back there since 2018. What do you miss? The weather, honestly. <laughs> I mean, now I'm in Florida, so it's a little better. But when I'm in Toronto and it gets really cold and it's like, yeah, I definitely miss the weather. Uh, yeah, the weather, the people, you know, the lifestyle. Uh, it's just awesome over there. Obviously, Trinidad's beautiful. Josh Leendo from Canada, Commonwealth Games champion and bronze medalist from last year's World Championships. Second place, it's Leendo. Crusade, he's extending the lead. When you read any biography of you, it mentions first and foremost that you are an elite swimmer who is on this upward rise. But the other thing it always points out is that you know, you are the first black swimmer to have achieved this, to have achieved that. And in a lot of the races, you're the only black swimmer who, who's in the water. Why do you think there's so few people of color uh, in elite swimming? Well, obviously, you get the, the, the typical kind of stereotype, right? Um, and that's kind of, and then also, I think that kind of just puts it in your head that, oh, I don't want to swim. Like, swimming's not for, for us or that, that kind of mentality. And if it's something that you love, I think you should pursue it. And obviously for me, I've, my, my parents have made so, so many sacrifices. But that's kind of a big reason why, why I'm in that sport and why I think I've been so successful is because of just the amount of support that I've had. So, I mean, as you do better and better, there are going to be kids, like of all colors, but certainly black kids, who are going to see you, I assume, and go, hey, that, like that's an option for me. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely something cool to think about. Um, it's kind of strange because, you know, at one point you're a kid, you're looking up to you know, whoever it is, like basketball players, you're, you're, you're looking up to people as role models and it's kind of a kind of a cool thing, but something I have to think about then me actually being a, a role model myself is, uh, is, it feels kind of surreal. Yeah, speaking of role models, I think Allen Iverson is, uh, has words that you live by, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I love Allen Iverson. My parents and my, both my mom and my dad loved watching basketball when I was younger, but I kind of, I think I, I watched a documentary about him first and some, I just really connected uh, with him on how, because obviously he, he was different for a lot of people in the league and he changed the game. Uh, and just, I, I really identify with him on that and how he was, you know, stayed true to himself no matter what. Let's talk about the Canadian swim team. The, the women have been killing it, right? Like for a few Olympic cycles. And may I say, they've been more successful than, than the male swimmers. Do you and, and, and the other guys, do you guys talk about that? Something we always talk about, you know, the girls being good and, you know, how we have to step up. And it's something that we know. Um, hasn't always been easy, but it's definitely a work in progress and I'm working towards it. Like I said, Finley getting his first, uh, his first international um, gold medal at a, at a high level long course uh, championships. It's a gold medal going the way of Canada. Finlay knocks. Big upset. We've got another gold medal winning country here at the Doha World Championships. Coach is happy. Big win for Canada. So that's definitely got me pretty excited for what's to come at, at the Olympics. But I mean, I, I think we're looking good. I think we have good talent and we have definitely a pretty good momentum going to the games. As you prepare for Paris, prepare for the Olympics, I'm just curious, what's it like for you between now and then? 
I'm not thinking about, you know, the Olympics, the dates and the times, but I, I, I don't, I don't get ahead of myself. I try to stay in the moment and control what I can right now. Um, cause I'll, there's a lot of steps leading up to going to Olympics, ga Olympic games, you know, there's obviously some meets getting ready, the training, uh, you know, weight room, wh whatever it is. And obviously there's Olympic trials and then there's, you know, getting acclimatized for different time zones. And then there's the Olympics. So there's a lot of things that lead up to actually the day of your event. And I just try to take it one step at a time. What do you want to achieve in Paris? I mean, so last time I, I, I missed out on, on a final it individually, I, we did make the final in the relay, but I definitely want to get myself in an individual final. And then from there at the Olympics, anything can happen in a final. Being an Olympian is an incredible thing. Uh, to, to be a medalist would be even better. And we wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is a sport where the margin of victory can be counted in hundredths of a second, and Joshua Leendo keeps getting faster. At the 2023 World Championships in Hungary, he placed second in the 100-meter butterfly, setting a Canadian record. A community's only school has burned to the ground after flames grew so large they couldn't be tamed. What are we going to do without water? How hundreds of kids are being forced to adapt. Fire destroys the only school on a remote First Nation. A crisis for our children. Some have been flown out to study in the city. My daughter, she says she's she's scared, but you know, excited at the same time. But they have good reason to fear that a new permanent school might take a while. Sarah Law traveled to Iabmatung First Nation in northwestern Ontario to break down all the hurdles they face in trying to get their school back. The John C. Yasno Education Center was at the heart of the community in Yabmatan First Nation, a school for nearly 300 kids from junior kindergarten to grade nine. And I stand in that spot and I looked at it. I started crying because I thought of this school as my friend. My friend had helped me for my healing journey. I had a bunch of fun times over there. Mm. Had fun with my teacher. Recess too. But this is what remains of the school after an alleged arson in late January burned it all down. People here are still reeling. Four teenagers have been charged for this. A fire that overwhelmed the First Nations capacity to save the building. The community has a fire truck, but with the lack of infrastructure in place, even if it was fully operational, this fire still wouldn't have been able to been put out. This uh, water reservoir down there that we use, we use, it only lasted about 45 minutes. So even if we had fire trucks that are operational, you know, what are we going to do without water? The immediate issue now is getting the students back in classrooms. Some of the grade nines have already left the community. Traveling south, some 360 kilometers to attend school in Thunder Bay. There's a mixed emotion, especially for my daughter. She says she's she's scared, but you know, excited at the same time. The community wants to build a temporary school by September 1st, but it won't be easy. While supplies are usually transported on the winter road, the warm weather has made that route unreliable. The onus is after we make our plan has to go to the federal government to fund that. They have the resources to do that, but it is an emergency and a crisis for our children. After we left Yabmatan, the Federal Minister of Indigenous Services met with the chief in Thunder Bay. Minister Haidu confirmed to him the government is spending more than $13 million to build five modular buildings the community can use as temporary classrooms. And that Ottawa is wholeheartedly with the community and will be there to support them in building their new permanent school. But there are no plans in place yet for a permanent structure. There's good reason for Iamatan to push for quick action. Pekanchikam First Nation waited a decade for its new school after it burned down. Last fall, Wapakika First Nation held a grand opening ceremony eight years after its school was destroyed. Iamatan First Nation has been under a long-term boil water advisory since 2002. The community knows how to do without. 
without proper fire and water services, enough housing, but they say they won't let their youth go without an education, no matter what. Sarah, it's been a few weeks since you've been in the community. Any new developments there? Yes, a few positive things have happened. I spoke with Chief at Lucan over the phone this week. He says cleanup efforts are already underway to remove the debris from the former school. And supplies are already starting to arrive up by the winter road for the temporary school to be built. And the community is really taking advantage of the recent cold snap to get as many materials up as possible while that road is in good condition. Of course, it's much more expensive to get these materials up by plane than by the winter road. So some things moving forward. How's the chief feeling about all of this? Well, he says he's feeling pretty positive, as is the rest of the community. He also says the, that Ontario's Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Greg Rickford, has made a few verbal commitments. These include fixing up the unfinished treatment centre in the community, which would serve as a base for the school's land-based learning program, and extending the community hall to make room for school activities. Another positive is adding some artificial ice to the arena to promote more youth recreation. So overall, so far, so good. Time will tell whether both levels of government deliver on their promises, but the community is adamant that they will do whatever it takes to make sure that their students get an education. Sarah Law reporting from Thunder Bay tonight. Another story we're working on, decoding your canine's thoughts. If you've always wanted to know what's on your pet's mind, there's a group of people who say they can help, but it will cost you. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what your pet is thinking? Yeah, I ask her constantly what's going on inside that coconut. <laughs> and I never think I'll find an answer. But what if you could? I assume it's pretty standard. Uh, it will go from food, 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 to sleep, 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 and then to play, 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 and then repeat. What if there was more? But of course, you ever stare into her eyes and think, what is going on in there? Of course, I mean, you always want to know what your, your animal is thinking. Come here. Well, it turns out you may be able to find out if, like a growing number of Canadians, you're willing to pay for a paranormal peek into your pet's mind. How's business these days? How would you describe it? Absolutely phenomenal. On the upswing. All right, Rui, come on in. Angel Morgan is a pet psychic. These days, she's often seeing more than 20 pets a week and charges up to $200 an hour to tap into what animals like Brewery have to say. The rise of pet psychics, that is coming soon, right here on The National. Coming up now, though, a unique call for police in Texas. Go, goats, go. Back to where you came from, please. A herd of goats surprise takeover of a residential neighborhood. It's our moment. Well, you're looking at a shot from a police officer's body cam in Texas during what turned out to be a very unusual call. Those goats you saw appear to come out of nowhere, catching residents by surprise and forcing police to jump into action. And tonight, the team effort to track them all down makes our moment. Going this way, we need them to go that way. It was a unique disturbance call in an Arlington, Texas neighborhood. I told you, it's a bunch of goats. But they don't have a choice. A herd of more than 60 goats taking over a community that was unaware of their presence. I didn't know we had goats. Oh, it was a mess. Like, you know, they're kind of cute. Go, goats, go. Back to where you came from, please. While giving police a new skill to strive for. Who knew we were goat wranglers now? The goats were originally brought in as part of a project to eat and clear out brush from a nearby park. How they got loose, we still don't know. <laughs> this is this is the most insane thing I've ever. Come on, goats! Keep on moving. After the initial confusion, officers worked together to get the animals back to their enclosure, allowing the goats to get back to work, giving the officers the green light to celebrate the job well done. Success. 
So I was doing some quick research during the commercial breaks. Turns out goatscaping is not what you might think it is. And also that I was reading an article talked about the things you need to be concerned about. There's a lot of good things like goats eat just about anything. And then they of course fertilize the land. But fences, the number two challenge when you have goats doing stuff and you can see why. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. Good night.